The job support, of course, coming in better than expected with 199,000 jobs added. The unemployment rate unexpectedly falling to 3.7 percent. Joining us now is Julia Pollack, Zip Recruiter Chief Economist. Hey, Julia. Um, so we've had the benefit of some hours now to digest the numbers here. As you've had time to sort of percolate on it, what's your big takeaway of sort of where we are in this employment cycle? So it was a mixed report with a huge household survey and uh, a weaker, a narrower uh, uh, establishment survey. I think the overall takeaway is that the picture remains intact. The labor market is slowing. So that 199,000 number should really be uh, quite a bit lower because 35,000 of those workers were just people returning from strike. That puts the underlying rate of growth at around 160,000, which is exactly in line with the 2019 average. The labor market is all the way back to pre-pandemic normal. And Julia, let me ask you about one metric there. Um, it's getting a lot of interest. That an unemployment rate ticking down to 3.7%. Mm -hmm. Just walk us through, Julia. You know what explains that? You know, did that tick down for all the right reasons? Yes, it ticked down because of new entrants coming in. Uh, but this is a volatile measure. The household survey in general is a volatile survey that showed 700, more than 700,000 people uh, coming to work uh, in, in, um, in November. A uh, huge employment increase, which we know is just statistical noise, right? Last month it showed 300,000 people uh, leaving employment. And so uh, it's important not to focus on one number. Overall, unemployment has been around three 3.7, 3.8% the last couple of months, give or take. Um, one of the numbers you were looking at as well, not to pick on another individual number, um, is aggregate labor income, which is the number of employees working times uh, the hourly wage. Um, their working hours, that is, times the hourly wage. And there we saw um, growth of about 8%. So that's hourly workers working more, making more per hour, if I'm reading that correctly. What does that imply about sort of lower income hourly workers? Yeah, so it's, it's grown 5.3% year over year. Uh, it's grown 9.1% in just the last month on an average annualized basis. Uh, that's very strong. Uh, right before the pandemic, it was growing 4.6% year over year. Uh, so when you have that amount of income going into the economy, labor income, even if consumers are seeing their access to consumer credit decline, it's not going to have such a huge effect on overall consumer spending because it's going to be offset by the resilience of the labor market. And I think that bodes well for companies going forward, even though these interest rate hikes have, are really biting, right? They're holding a lot of companies back. They're holding people back from buying homes. They're having quite a severe effect on many, many markets and industries. Uh, there's, a, there's sort of a floor under that effect because the labor market is still so resilient. And Julia, I'm interested too, just the impact of strikes or the, the end of major strikes. How did that impact this report and what do you think it means for the December report? Sure, so in this report, 96,000 people were absent from work last month due to strikes. And this month, that number fell to 61,000. A more normal number in this report is 10,000 a month. Uh, in recent months, there had been a lot of strike activity and the number was hovering around 30,000, which was pretty remarkable and, and high historically. Uh, so this is still a time of a lot of labor action. Uh, these acute labor shortages after the pandemic paired with this huge surge in inflation that left many workers behind when it comes to real wages, have caused workers to organize and, and uh, fight to be made whole. Um, and Julia, um, let's look ahead a little bit to 2024, because you say we're on the verge of another sort of roaring 20s, if you will. Um, it, it does, you know, that's not kind of what the rhetoric, I think, that, that we are hearing would sort of indicate. So what, what does that mean to you, roaring 20s? So the, roaring, the, the original 20s were a time of huge innovation, growing well-being and wealth, uh, largely because of a transportation revolution, a power revolution, right? Uh, households and factories got um, uh, electricity, they got cars, they got tractors, uh, and uh, you know it was off to the races. Well, this time we have two huge innovations that are also creating uh, very exciting prospects in the labor market and across the economy, a green energy revolution 
and also uh, AI. So another productivity enhancing innovation there. You know, there will be some differences. I think we'll avoid the crash that ended the last Roaring Twenties, uh, which was a result of very low interest rates that fueled a speculative mania. We've, uh, we, we, we got the crash out of the way at the beginning of these Twenties, and, um, and we're going to have probably higher interest rates for the foreseeable future that will put some restraint on that kind of activity. Uh, but companies are in a good position now with strong balance sheets, uh, with these microchip shortages easing, with supply chain difficulties uh, working themselves out. And when the Fed does start cutting rates, I think we'll see a flurry of activity. And Julia, so I'll get you out of here on this one. You know, we, we got through that jobs report, Julia. What's the next big economic indicator you're going to be looking for? Is, is it November CPI, for example? Absolutely. All eyes will be on inflation. You know, I think the jobs numbers are not really going to sway the Fed that much one way or the other. It's the inflation reports that are really the ones to watch to figure out the path of interest rates going forward. Julia Pollack, thank you so much for joining us today, Julia. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Josh.